All right. Um, so last week, um, we spent a considerable amount of time just talking through this picture here, um, introducing these sigma types and pi types, um, which are generalizations of things that we already know about if we've been following along with the Yorgi lectures. Um, for example, um, if we have the type of either alpha and beta, which we can write in type theory as alpha plus beta, so it's the sum type. And if you want to understand why we call it a sum type, you can think, well, if this alpha has n possible values and this beta has m possible values, then this either alpha beta, um, because it's either an alpha or a beta, it has m plus m n possible values. So that's why we call it a sum type. Um, now, if you think about how Haskell actually stores one of these, um, like if you, if you open up the, the runtime, you'll find it's actually storing a pair of things. It's going to store a tag that tells you whether it's the left or the right. Um, and then it's going to be stored next to that. It's going to store a value of either an alpha or a beta. So the type of the, uh, the second bit depends on the value of that tag. Um, so when we generalize to this sigma type, what we're really doing is we're just saying, well, instead of just having these finite enumeration tag types, we'll generalize to any type, and then we'll have a function v, which takes a value of this type and, can, and gives us back a type, and then we'll do the sum over all of those types. Um, so by having these, these arbitrary tag types, we have, I guess, a, a richer language of these kind of sum types, but we also have the possibility of infinite sums. Uh, and then yeah, the story goes on. Um, but the main reason I wanted to show you that was uh, actually just to give you a little bit of context for this idea of values, sorry, types that depend on values. Uh, so, <clears throat> for example, here in the, the sigma type, um, yeah, we have a, a record, uh, oops. <laughs> has two components of the first and the second. The first is a value of this tag type i, and the second is a value of a type that depends on the value of the first component. So this, this function v takes a value of type i, gives us back a type, and that's, so v of, for the first component is the type of the second component. Um, right, so that's, that's one of the ways in which we can have uh, types that depend on values. Um, so this is in a record where the, the type of the second component depends on the value of the first. Uh, the other is in the, the, the pi type where we have um, uh, this kind of thing, like a function arrow where we have a function from bool to this stuff, um, but this stuff depends on the value of the bool. So we actually give a, a name to the value of the bool as well as the type. And then the, the return type is a thing that depends on the value of that bool. Uh, so there's, there are two ways we can have uh, types that depend on values. Right, so we didn't do this last week, last month, but there's actually another way we could write this sigma type, and this is using the like the GADT syntax from uh, from Haskell. But in type theory, we actually call these things inductive families. Um, so here we have a, a data type. It's a type. It takes parameter types i, parameter type i, <coughs> and parameter uh, function v from i to data types has a constructor, comma, um, and then these are like the, the components of this constructor, and this is the type that this constructor gives you back. So in this case, the type only depends on the parameters to the data type and not on these values. But the second component of this constructor, its type depends on the value of the first component. So this is just an alternative way of writing the same thing. It actually has slightly different behavior in Anchor, but um, nothing that's important for tonight. <clears throat> Let's do a quick review of equality. 
So here is our type describing equality relations. Not this one to change. Um, so we're actually defining equality as a type here. Um, this is a type that takes a parameter alpha, which is a type, and a parameter x, which is a value of type A. So here again we have a thing here which depends, which is a value of a type which is, we've just brought into scope. Um, equality is then indexed by another thing of type alpha. Uh, so, so when we when we write down an equality type, we have to give the x, which is the parameter, and then an index of the same type. And of course, the the thing we want to express with equality is that the things on both sides are the same. And so we only give a single constructor where the value of the index is the same as the value of the parameter. Okay, so, so when we give a parameter, then the thing in that position in the type always has to be the same as the parameter when we, when we give the return type of the constructor. Um, but the thing on the right, because it's an index, we can say, we can make that whatever we like. Like we could say um, something like this for a y, x equals y. But it's, it's happy with that definition because it doesn't mind that I've changed the thing on the right of the y, but if I try to make this thing on the left a y, it would say no, you can't do that. Um, so the, the point of defining equality this way is that then when we, we we can construct evidence that things are equal by just constructing them in a context where the type checker can see that they're the same. So when I say 2 plus 3 here, um, that reduces to 5, and so the type checker can see that the thing on the left is the same as the thing on the right, so it's happy to accept this um, evidence of that equality. Um, and the other side of that is that when we then pattern match on a REFL, we're in a sense reminding the type checker that we previously checked that some things are equal. And so now the type checker treats those things as equal in the rest of the expression. So when we pattern match on this x equals y, the type checker says, okay, well that, that, that y is really just x. So then it's happy to accept REFL as the evidence that f of x is the same as f of y. So there's, there's two sides. We have to construct things in a context where the indices make sense, and then when we pattern match on them, we get that evidence back. So the next step is to make our data types a little bit more interesting. Um, the call is a bit strange because when you actually erase all these indices, if I say, well, I'm not interested in that type of index there, so that disappears, and this x isn't doing much here, I'll get rid of that, and now this alpha is not doing much, and you're basically left with the unit type. So it's just a, a type, a single constructor, just like, like this, it's exactly this one down here. So it's the only thing that's interesting about equality is the type indices. Just put that back. So continue the journey. Um, what I want to express here is, is a type that gives me evidence that a particular thing is in a particular list. Um, so our 
uh, type as, as, as a, an infix constructor, an infix um, yeah, type constructor. So it takes a, a thing on the left and a thing on the right. It has an implicit argument alpha, which is a type. It takes an, a parameter of a value x with type alpha and is <coughs> indexed by a list of alphas. Okay, so the thing on the left always has to be x. The thing on the right can be any list we want, as long as it's, as long as it's in scope. <laughs> so given that a list can be constructed two ways, it's either the empty list or a cons with a, of a of an element with another list. Um, we can also say that there are two ways of giving evidence that a particular thing is in a list. It's either at the front of the list or it's in the rest of the list. So we're going to have two constructors for defining this relation. The first case is when uh, x is at the beginning of the list and the way we say this is that for all x's, x is in the list constructed by sticking x on the front of x's. So we're saying it doesn't matter what x's is, it could be an empty list, it could be a list of whatever. But if we stick an x on the front of that, then x is in the list that we get as a result, by definition. You've got to make that x's implicit. The other case is when x is in the rest of the list, and so we're going to pick out another element on the front, that's going to be y. So for any y and x's, if x is in x's, then x is in the list constructed by sticking y on the front of x's. So we're saying x is somewhere in the end of the list. Okay, so these, these are the two ways that something can be found in a list and we're, we're essentially defining this relation of what it means <coughs> for a particular thing to be on a particular list. Okay, so just happy with that. Let's just get some practice at actually constructing these things. I want to construct evidence that 0 is in the list 0, 1, 2. Uh, well, there are two possible ways I could do that. Let's try suck or something. So we'll do the, the magic. Uh, control C, control space to um, say, does this work? It says, well, I don't know yet. It could be later in the list. Um, so you can see now that the, the goal has actually changed. So now we want to construct evidence that zero is in the list one, two. So maybe it's, or well, is it zero? No. Is it stuck of something? Maybe. Is it zero? Is it suck of something? And now our goal is there we go. now our goal is to prove that zero is in the empty list. And if we look at our two constructors, neither of the constructors give us a way of proving that something is in an empty list, because both of these have a non-empty list on the right side of the, the in relation. Okay, so if we try to say zero here, it won't take it. And if we try to say suck of something, it doesn't like that either. So obviously, the mistake we made was right back at the beginning. And it's quite happy with that, because it can, the type checker can see that this zero and zero is here, so it's able to construct this case here. So now, in this case, again, if we try to say zero, it won't accept it, but if we go suck of suck of zero, that's quite happy with that. So something to notice here is, is that I've, I've named these things, these constructors with the same names that we gave the constructors of the natural numbers type. Um, and that's, well, it's because Agda allows us to overload constructor names. These are not referring back to the natural numbers and actually making new constructors. Um, and because you always have to get type signatures out, you can always work out which thing you're trying to construct. So I can distinguish between yeah, whether I'm trying to construct one of these or a natural number. But um, obviously there's 
there's a good, and good value in the analogy here because what we're really doing is we're counting in the number of steps we have to go into the list to find the thing that we're constructing the evidence for. So not only is this evidence that the thing is there, but it tells us where to find it. Right, let's try this one. Um, obviously, we, we're going to be a little bit uh, impressed. Um, can't say zero, we can maybe say suck. Now we can say neither. Um, so clearly, we're not going to be able to construct something of this type. And <coughs> Remember, if you want to remember back to our initial equality examples, um, there's a way of actually expressing that you can't construct something. So if you have, have a type that you think is uninhabited, then the way to prove that it's uninhabited is by mapping it into the canonical empty type, which is zero. So we know that we can't construct something of zero. So if we can make a function with this type, then we also know that we can't construct something of that other type. So now that we have a parameter, let's give it a name, make a goal. We can now do the magic case split on bogus, so it's control C, control C. And it's said, well, maybe it's a suck. But you notice that it hasn't actually given us a zero case. Normally when we do the case split, we get we get one for each case of the, the thing, and that's because the type checking can see that these aren't equal, so there's no way that's, that zero, that this could have been a zero, but maybe it's a suck of something up, some other thing, because maybe that three is somewhere later in the list and it hasn't moved that far yet. Um, so we can ask it to look that far, and again, by doing successive case splits, and now we look at our goal. Uh, we've got something in our context which cannot be, so if we try and do a case split on that, Agnes says, okay, well now there's no case to answer. So this open, close parentheses is, is Agnes' way of saying, okay, you don't have to do anything because I know that that, that thing just doesn't exist. So now you may be wondering, well, what use is this thing that tells us that the thing is in the list? Um, well, maybe we can use it to get something out of the list. Um, but it's obviously no use for, like if we have i is in some i's, it's obviously no use for getting i out of i's because we already know what it is. Because um, to, to express that i is in i's, we already have to have i in scope. Um, but maybe, like if we have some other list, some other thing that's indexed by i's, then maybe it's useful for that. Okay, so here's a thing. What we're going to make here is a heterogeneous list um, that is indexed by some set, so it's parameterized by some set i implicitly. It's also parameterized by a function v. It takes a value of type i and gives us back a type, and is indexed by a list of i's. <clears throat> so in the example here, you can see that the idea is, so this is, remember these underscores here become placeholders where you can stick things in a mix-fix kind of way. So here we're constructing an example of a heterogeneous list, which is indexed by the list false true false. So obviously, from that we can infer that our index type i here is bool. So we're indexed by the list false true false. And those things are interpreted by this function here, which takes a boolean. And if the boolean is true, is the type nat, otherwise it's string. Okay, so the idea is we can we have this function here that takes a value of this index type and gives us back a type. And so then the corresponding places in the heterogeneous list have that type given by the corresponding thing in the, in the list of indices. 
right? Okay, I obviously can't make this example yet because we've got to define a type. Just as we did for our homogeneous lists, there are two ways of making a, making a list. We have an empty case, and we have a case where we have a, a thing const on the front of some other list. So for the empty case, well, the type of the empty heterogeneous list is just the, uh, the heterogeneous list which is indexed by the empty homogeneous list. Again, I'm using the same constructor names for homogeneous and heterogeneous lists, um, but they actually mean different things. In the const case, it's a little bit more interesting, what we want to do is we want to stick a value, so it's going to be v of i for some i, on the front of another heterogeneous list, which is also indexed by v, and is indexed by some other list i's, and that's going to give us a heterogeneous list which is indexed by v, and is indexed by i const with i's. Okay, so we're extending the heterogeneous list by extending the index, the, the list that it's indexed by. <coughs> I'm going to bring this i and i's into scope, so I'll just say for all i and i's, and I'll make those implicit. And I'll type this. Let's go with that. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. So I have an index list, which is either empty or a cons. I have a heterogeneous list, which is either empty or a cons. And in both cases, the the types of the two parts of that cons are indexed respectively by the, the same things in the resulting list. Okay, so what do we get here? For example, we're going to have to provide false converts to a string, true converts to a nat, so we're going to need a list which has a string followed by a nat followed by a string. It's not quite right because I need to terminate the list. Okay. So that type checks. This is not a dynamic language. Um, so that is actually typed, like in the sense that if I made this a string, it doesn't like it. <coughs> Okay, now remember we said that these, this in relation is, is an element of, not only tells us that something's in a list, but it tells us where it is. So now we have this thing that's indexed by a list of somethings, and this thing that's indexed by a list. Maybe we can define another thing where we've got one of these that's indexed by i's and we've got one of these that's indexed by i's. Can we do something useful with this? Um, given that our i counts along something, that's we, we could either, like we look at our goal here, we've got one of these in relations and we've got a heterogeneous list, so we could do a case split on either of those. Um, and you end up with the same result, but it looks a little bit nicer if we start with i's. We break that into the two cases. Clean up. Um, we're going to start with the sup case. If we look at our goal. We have, <clears throat> have an i which tells us that i, or dot i, is in, in dot x's, and we have an x's which is a heterogeneous list indexed by a dot y and a dot x's. Um, I don't really care about this y anymore because I want these things to line up. So I'm just going to do a case split on x's now. Splits it out into an x and an x's. 
Okay, so now x has some type v of dot i sub 1. I don't even know what dot i sub 1 is. Actually, it's going to be suck of i, so it's like the, the next list out, but we've already gone deeper into the list, so we don't care about that anymore. Um, but now I've got this dot i's in dot i's, and I've got an x's which is indexed by dot i's, which is exactly what these two parameters line up with. So we've got a recursive call here. Subjects. What can we do with this case? Now you notice I've got zero on the end here, so <laughs> I've already set myself up for failure. <laughs> um, but that's just because I, I haven't filled this in yet. I wanted to figure it out as we went. Um, so now I've got an x's which is indexed by dot i and comes with dot x's. I've got a dot x's and a dot i. Um, well, since I've only got a dot i and I don't have a dot i's anymore to correspond to these x's, then I probably don't care about these x's anymore. So let's do a case split on x's. Okay, so now I've got this x which is a dot v dot i. Maybe that's what we want to return. Okay, so we've got a heterogeneous list which is indexed by i's. We've got a thing which tells us not only that i is in i's, but it tells us where it is. Maybe if we go to that corresponding position in this heterogeneous list, which is interpreted by V, we'll find a thing of type VI. <coughs> and that's exactly what we've done. Um, because this is parametric in all of these things, it could not have done anything else. Um, so yeah, so there's no maybe here, like when we index into a list, you normally expect to see a maybe, or you know, see, you expect to see an error call buried in here somewhere, but no, this thing guarantees that there is something there, and tells us what its type is. So, for example, If we look at the first spot, which was a string, that type checks that it's a string. But if we say suck of zero, it says no, that's supposed to be a nat. Okay. This is not a dynamic language. <laughs> We're not just picking things out of uni type lists. So what can we do with all this stuff now? You might think, well, when do I actually ever use a heterogeneous list? Um, so one thing that dependently typed languages are really good at is embedded DSLs. So we're going to embed the simply typed lambda calculus. Um, there's probably not actually a lot of point to this in terms of like you know, using the simple type language calculus as an embedded language for doing something. Um, but it's a really good example because it not only uses a way to demonstrate how these these you know these two relations here make things line up uh, when you're working with you know, interestingly typed things. Um, it's also uh, probably the smallest language I could come up with that does something that can be quite hard, and that's expressing uh, things that bind values in a DSL. So where you have like a function that takes a parameter, and you've got to somehow give a name to that parameter so you can use it somewhere else in the DSL. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah, so obviously that's something we're going to have to deal with in this language. So let's just stop and have a little chat about this 
simply type to do the calculus. <clears throat> what we want to be able to write is something like this function we call twice. This example comes from uh, the lecture series by Connor McBride, uh, which is where I pretty much learned all this stuff. Um, so yeah, I ripped it straight from him. Um, so I want to be able to express the function that uh, takes a lambda of something of type t to t. So, so this is part of the simply typed lambda calculus language. We have to explicitly, I'm sorry, better give it a name. So this is a, a thing which takes a, uh, a, an argument f of type t to t for some t, and I should really say what t is, but let's say that for any t we could actually make a thing with that t, but the quantifying over this t is not part of the simple type lambda, lambda calculus. Um, so the lambda x, which is of type t, I want to say f, f, x. Um, and the way we're actually going to render this in the DSL is to say something like some constructor lamb, um, which is, uh, yeah, let's just go straight to De Bruyne indices. Um, <laughs> So the lamb constructor is going to be indexed with um, two things, like the, uh, the type of the argument and the type of the result. So it's going to be a t to t, and the result of the whole thing is going to be a, And that's going to be wrapped around another lamb of a type of t and returning, uh, I think, a, a t. Obviously, the result type of this has to line up with the thing you get when you construct a function from a t to a t. Um, <clears throat> and that's going to be wrapped around this thing, which is the thing that's bound by this lambda, which is we're going to count out one, two lambdas, so oh, sorry, zero, one lambdas, so that's going to be a var one. So this is a De Bruyne indice, so you, you take this number and you count out that many lambdas, and that's the variable it's referring to. And we're going to use a dollar sign for function application, and then I'm going to refer to var one. Zero. So this zero refers to the first lambda, and these two refer to the second one. Does that kind of make sense? Um, but remember these these indices here, these types are part of the simple type lambda calculus. We don't, we don't get those inferred for free. Oh yeah, first we've got to actually define the language of types. <laughs> um, there are two ways of constructing types in the simply type lambda calculus. We have um, some type iota, um, and that's, that's a type by definition. It's like a, a primitive which we're going to eventually render out to some agda type, but we're just going to denote it by iota. And then we have the function arrow, uh, the triangle. So if, if we have some type T or some, some type S, which is a type, and some type T, which is a type, then we have that uh, S to T. 
is also a type. Okay, so we've just got two ways of constructing a type. There's a primitive type, and there's an arrow type which constructs the function type. So these things would actually be these little triangles here. So. And here is basically the data type that gives us those type constructors. So we have iota, this is a primitive type, and a function arrow takes a pair of types and gives us back the function type from that type to that type. And now that we have this little language of types, we can actually render that as an actor type by just giving a function from type to set. We do a case split on T, control C, control C. We get the two cases and then run that S T. And for this one, we just have to choose whatever our primitive type is going to be. So I'm going to choose the naturals. And here, we want to render our simply typed lambda calculus function type as an agda function. So that's going to be something to something. Of course, in this case, we want it to be the interpretation of S. In this case, we want it to be the interpretation of T. Okay. So this is one of the cool things you get about in a language where you've kind of broken down the barriers between you know, values and type. Well, broken down the syntactic barriers, at least, between um, types and values. Um, if you want a, a type function, you just write a function that returns a type. Uh, and later, we'll see that like, when you want to if you want a local binding within a type, you just write a local binding within a type. Um, yeah, because they're just functions. Um, so now that we have our language of types, we can describe our language of terms. And you know, as I mentioned, there are three cases, the lambda, the var, and the function application. In the lambda case, yeah, so now I have to explain about context. Um, it's great that you know we can give this thing a type, but we also need to be able to talk about terms down at this level. And we need to be able to give this thing a type, even though we're not, well, when we're looking at this, we're not sort of in the context of a lambda. Um, so when we're describing the types of things, we say things have a type in context. Well, this thing has a type in the empty context, this thing is going to have a type in a context which contains the type of this and the type of this. So type in context is just a list of types, and that's what this thing is here. So a term has a type, is indexed by a type, in a context which is a list of types. So they're the parameters that we're going to have to wrap up in lambdas at some point if we want to get a, a thing that has a type in the empty context. So for the lambda case, we want to build a term in some context gamma that has the type of S to T. And to get that, we provide a term <coughs> that has type T when the context is ex extended by an extra, an extra type, which is S. So when we go under a lambda, the context grows by the type of this thing. When we go under this lambda, we have two things in our context. So it's extended. Uh, so this will now be the thing at the front of the context, and this will be pushed further down. Um, so that's why you know, how to brew an indices count from the inside out. Because we're basically indexing into this list. So then the var <coughs> says, well, if, if t is a type in a context, that not only proves that it is there, but where it is, then var of that thing is a term of type t in context gamma. Function application uh, takes two things, both in context gamma. We have a function from s to t, a thing of type s to t, and a thing of type S, then we construct a thing of type T. 
pretty abstract, but let's let's actually build this function. So I'm gonna basically just write this. Uh, so I'm lamb lamb <coughs> of uh, sub zero Okay, so this is just this, but you notice I didn't have to tell it what these types were. I'm taking advantage of Agda here because when I define these, this syntax, I said, well, I'm going to make these parameters here implicit. So they're still there, but I'm just making Agda work them out for me, so I don't have to write them myself. If I made these explicit, then I would have to give these annotations on my LAN, on my, well, you know, on all of them. So for our final trick, um, I want to actually render not only the type as an angular thing, but I want to render this as an angular thing. So this is going to be a function which takes a term of type T in a context gamma, as well as an environment. So that's what this thing is here. It's a heterogeneous list indexed by gamma, which is a list of types, interpreted by the function which interprets types as agda terms. So this, this is what we call an environment. It's like a, a list of values that are in context in parallel with the types that are in context. And that's going to be enough to interpret our, um, our terms. So what are we going to get out of the end here? We're going to get, we want to interpret this thing as an agda term. So we're going to get an agda term, but what's what's its type going to be? It's going to be a thing of the type of the interpretation of T. All right, so let's do it. So this is our, our context and this is our term, so I want to do a case split on the term. Give me an extra parameter there. <coughs> okay, so now if you look at our goal, you see that. Our goal is a function type, and that's because when we have a lambda term, the type of that term is a, is a function type in the embedded language. But of course, when we when we take the interpretation of that, we get an actual agda function. So we can make a lambda here. Uh, okay, so now we have a, an interpretation of s in that context, and a thing of of this type as our goal, <clears throat> we have a thing which can produce a T if we interpreted it in this extra context here. Um, so well, let's, let's just try and interpret it. Um, so that's going to be one of those in some context. I'm not sure what that context is yet. Of D. What does it want for the context? So now it wants, um, sorry, in the environment, it wants a thing of a heterogeneous list which is gamma extended, indexed by gamma extended by S. Um, we have a heterogeneous list which is indexed by gamma, and we have a thing which is the interpretation of S. Okay, so we just, oops, it's going to be S on the front of. 
cool. Damn. So, so a lambda renders, not surprisingly, as a lambda, uh, where we interpret the body of the lambda in an in extended environment. Just as we extended the context, we now extend the environment. Uh, in this case, we want to produce a thing of type T, we have things we could interpret to get an S and an S to T, so let's just interpret those things in the context gamma. F and interpretation in context gamma of X. Now not white space. So, so yeah, so the, the interpretation of function application is a function application. So now we have a thing that says t is in gamma, and we have a list of that's indexed by gamma. We want a thing which is this t interpreted by this same thing. Well, we've got a function for that. It's just a bang function. So, yeah, we demonstrate this. I'm just saying, well, let's let this be the interpretation in the empty context. So now it's a closed function. Okay, and actually now look at do the evaluation of this. I'm going to stop there. Um, <laughs> there's a bit more stuff down there that you can play with if you want. This is an alternative way to encode a lambda calculus that actually allows you to use the host language's binding system to describe bindings. Um, yeah. I haven't actually worked out yet how to convert one of those to the De Bruin form, but that's an exercise for the reader. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to leave it there. Um, comments or questions? Uh, can I get an explanation for that twice type signature there, that D equals T? In, oh, yeah. Yeah, that last, the speed of that last four bits there, like, what's going on there? Explain that to me a bit. So, more. well, as I mentioned before, like, one, one of the benefits you get when you, you sort of break down the syntactic barriers between you know, values and types is that um, you just write expressions in types. So, this is, this is the type signature here for this twice line. Um, when I interpret the, like, the embedded form of twice, um, I'm going to get a thing which has a type given by the interpretations of this type. So this, this T here is, is a value in our language of types. Um, so then to get an A to type, we have to interpret that type. Um, and just rather, rather than repeat this angle bracket T everywhere in here, I just thought I'd just do it once. Yeah, so you can like run twice hyphen suck zero to do the most convoluted plus two. Wow. Um, yeah, it hasn't worked out which constructors I made yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. um, it's just yeah, also overloaded. <laughs>
So I did. So didn't we tell it earlier that the, the primitive type we were using was always going to be a net? Um, yes, but um, this is it because it's all for all. Yeah, so I've got a for all here in the in the meta language, which is Agda. Yeah. Um, the super type language um, calculus doesn't have a for all, um, but I'm saying that for any type that we can make in the in, any type we can form in the type language of SDLC, I can make a function twice prime, uh, which has this type. Um, so, I just haven't told it which type. So yeah, so the other way I could do that would be just just say. Um, Twice prime of nah. Oh uh, yeah. Suck at zero. Because it doesn't have to return a uh, nah. Does it? it? Could be a. Sorry, not nah. Um, iota. Should be a street embedded. No. So yeah. Sorry, I need to get a type in the embedded language so that should actually mean iota. String me type. Suck at zero. Nah. But, I mean, the, the reason why I made this like this was because I wanted to be able to do things like uh, do an interpretation and then empty context of twice of twice of twice. So this is Lisbon. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very roundabout way of calculating powers of two. <laughs> yeah, but I mean the the point of all that exercise is is not so much to embed the super type named calculus, but to show that these types make things line up so that when you when you do a lambda you get a variable and then sometime buried in a whole bunch more lambdas and applications and you can do a variable reference, it gets the thing out of the right type. And that's, that's just because of the way we've set up our heterogeneous lists, index by lists of types. Okay, well that's it.